Uh, Marshall, thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure, Mukul. Thank you for having me. I'd like to start talking about your book with a simple question. You, know, you say that retailers often fail to match supply and demand. What are the consequences of that failure for them? Um, well, you see one of the consequences when you walk in many stores, um, which is uh, huge piles of merchandise uh, on sale at deep discounts, as much as 80%. There's a department store I visit from time to time for various reasons, and you'll see the aisles sorted into maybe three sections, 50% off, 70% uh, off, 80% off. So that's one consequence. Um, the consequence uh, for retailers is, uh, is obviously lower profit, which can come in one of two ways. The, the excess that we just talked about, which means you're selling things uh, frequently below what it costs you to, to buy it and get it into the store, so you lose money. Uh, or, uh, so that's the excess side, or you don't have enough of something and a customer walks in and uh, can't find what they're looking for. And uh, that's a lost sale. So th there's a couple interesting st statistics that uh, until 1995, when it um, got embarrassing, <laughs> department stores used to um, collect and report uh, an in industry number, which is the markdown percentage. Okay. In the mid, if I remember right, in the mid 70s, that was about 6%. And by 95, it had grown to something like 33%. It's not publicly reported anymore, but I heard a statistic that for one de leading department store, that number would now be 40%, which, which means that the average item sells for 40% off of full price. Uh, <clears throat> that's on the excess side. On the shortage side, there's a consulting firm that does an annual survey of consumers. This is in apparel. Um, where it's maybe hardest to match supply with demand. But they routinely uh, find that uh, people who respond to the survey will, will say that about a third of the time they walk into a store with a clear idea of what they want to buy and walk out empty-handed because they couldn't find what they came for. Which, which is pretty amazing if you think about it, that a $2 billion retailer is really a $3 billion retailer, but that third billion in revenue they're not getting because the, the, of the third of the people who walk out empty-handed because they couldn't come find what they came for. Now, does that imply that if retailers are able to make even small improvements in matching supply with demand, that this would have a fairly big impact on their profits? Yeah, absolutely. For a simple reason, retailing is a high fixed cost business. It costs a lot of money to maintain a store base and pay the associates that work in those stores. And you incur that cost whether you sell a, a dollar of merchandise in the, in the store or 10 million. So small increases in revenue <clears throat> have a big impact on profit. Uh, typical numbers for gross margin would be somewhere between 30 and 50%. So take a retailer whose gross margin is 50%, a uh, 5% increase in sales uh, with a 50% margin is 2.5% of revenue increase in profit, which for a lot of retailers would double their profit. So this one-third that walk out empty-handed because of, of stockouts or they can't find the product in the store or some sort of shortage problem, just correcting a little bit of that, uh, you know, cut that number from a third to 5% to less, uh, could double a retailer's profit. That's very interesting. And what implications do, does the relationship of the stock market valuation <coughs> of a retailer have to its ability to manage its inventory? Um, it, it's an interesting question because most analysts, uh, I think, don't pay enough attention to, uh, <coughs> to inventory or other operating variables of a retailer. Uh, and you can think of a number of them, but if we take uh, inventory as an example, a retailer can uh, enhance its revenue line with more inventory, okay? So come back to the example I described is that you'd like to have uh, better in stock so that people find what they came for uh, when they walk in the store. Uh, 
the, the best, the, the, the right way to accomplish that is more effective management of your inventory, better forecasting, uh, you know, better analysis of the margin of error around the forecast so you can risk adjust. The heavy-handed way to accomplish it is just jack up your inventory levels, and you can uh, improve in stocks with an in a, inefficient process. A retailer who does that will see an increase in revenue, but it's not a real improvement in the effectiveness of their performance. But it can look that way to the stock market. So if the market doesn't take into account the relationship between revenue and inventory, uh, they can be fooled that a retailer is, is having a good year when all they're doing is uh, forcing sales by, by uh, pumping excess inventory into an inefficient system. Now that brings Does us that make sense? Yes, no, absolutely. It's, it's sort of a subtle, a little bit complicated idea. But yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, in fact, uh, that, that uh, brings me to uh, one of the really interesting points in your book, where you note that ret many retailers are drowning in numbers but lacking in insight. Uh, how do you think they can correct this problem? Uh, well, well, that was actually a poster on the door of a woman that we worked with who was the vice president for uh, merchandising technology, I think was her title. And the quote was, we're awash in data and star for information. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. Well, the short answer to your question is they should buy this book and read it <laughs> and implement the results because right. that's essentially what we tried to do in this book is report about 10 years, more than 10 years of, of experience we've had working with retailers who who were awash in data but starved for information and helping them to interpret uh, all kinds of data, starting with POS sales data, uh, customer satisfaction surveys and um, demographic data about their stores. Um, if you think about what would cause you to be awash in data but starved for information, um, there are many things, but I'll mention a couple. One is, one is a lot of retailers until recently have not had sufficiently granular data. This may surprise you, but an apparel item, this shirt I'm wearing, what they would see is sales of this shirt for the entire chain across all sizes. Okay? They would not see the sales of this shirt in a medium in XYZ store last week. Uh, so they're left to to guess uh, the level of in stocks across the stores. Uh, they're left to guess as what is the right size mix. So, so that's point one, is until recently the data was, was too aggregated to be useful. You need at the microscopic level, how is this shirt selling in the Iowa store in a medium today? <laughs> the second point is that it's not enough to, to, to know whether an item is selling well, whether it's hot and you want to get more of it. It's not enough to know its sales level. You've got to know its sales level and other conditions that might affect uh, uh, the sales of that product. Competitive activity, weather, uh, how it's priced, how it's presented in the store. Is it well presented or is it somehow hidden in the back room? Uh, and so most retailers uh, don't collect that data they don't interpret it. Uh, so you need to look at sales and a handful of factors that are sales drivers uh, in order to accurately uh, predict from how an item is selling, how it will sell in the future. Those are a couple things. I could go on and on and on. But it's, it's uh, doable but, but non-trivial to look at the, the huge amount of data retailers have available to them now. It makes sense out of it, but, but you can, and, and then it's very powerful. Well, one of the things that makes it powerful is uh, you also mention in your book how retailers can crunch their sales numbers to identify some home run products uh, which they may be missing. Uh, can you explain how, how, that, how they can do that? Yeah, absolutely. So retailer, uh, the retail assortment is the set of products that's in the store at any point in time when you walk in. And retailers will uh, periodically update their assortment. They'll get rid of products that are not selling so well and add some new products that they think will sell better. The, uh, and, and you can think about 
those two decisions, get rid of the worst sellers and add some new products, which is the easier, the decision at least on which to get rid of is easier because you've got sales data so you can tell the dogs. You got to be a little careful that that product that's not selling very well is the favorite product of some of your best customers. And if you get rid of it, you not only lose the sales on that product, but you lose the customer and everything else they're buying. It's a, it's a serious problem in grocery. Okay, but other than that kind of subtlety, it's pretty easy to figure out what to get rid of. But what to add is harder. So a lot of retailers do something kind of like uh, gin rummy, you know, the card you, you discard your worst card and you draw randomly another card from the deck. So they'll add another uh, product. My colleagues and I thought about uh, how could we give better guidance on that. And the idea we uh, deployed is to think of a, a product, a stock keeping unit, a, we call it a SKU, as defined by its attributes. So this shirt I'm wearing would, you know, would be a knit, it's short sleeve, it's a certain color, it's a certain size. Um, and then use the sales of your current products, and we would do this in each and every store, to estimate the demand that customers have for, uh, for attributes. And then you can do something very powerful, which is to, um, <clears throat> uh, if I know the sales of this color and of short sleeve shirts and of mediums, I can figure out uh, sales of other products that are different combinations of attributes that I'm not currently selling. And we found amazingly that there'll be uh, products that the retailer thought there was no demand for, uh, so they didn't have very much of it. But if you analyze the data right, you see that there's a huge demand. So that, can you give an example? Yeah, sure. Tire, we worked with a tire retailer. Um, and one of the attributes was the price and quality level. They had six different price quality levels from cheapest to, to highest price. They didn't think uh, it appropriate to carry very much of the cheapest tire. So across something like 100 different sizes, there were only nine of these sizes in which they carried the lowest price, lowest quality tire. And so therefore, they didn't sell much of it. It was only 5% of their sales, therefore confirming their belief that customers really didn't want to buy this cheap tire. If you looked at the sizes, the nine sizes that they carried this lowest price point in, uh, across the six, it represented 60% of revenue. It outsold the next next uh, best-selling, I think, by 10 to 1. So the customers, if you look carefully at the data, were screaming, hey, price matters to us. <laughs> you know, we're, and, and the neighborhoods that these stores were in were less wealthy neighborhoods, so it was not surprising. So there was a whole set of, call them home-run products, that they were not aware of because of this self-fulfilling pr prophecy that we don't think our customers want to buy low-priced, cheap tires, so we're not going to carry them, and we don't sell a lot of them, and we were right. <laughs> In fact, they were dead wrong, and there was a huge opportunity there. So, so that's something we found to be very interesting. Absolutely. Well, an another issue that uh, you, you bring up in your book is that uh, Inflexible supply chains is the bane of almost all retailers. Uh, what are some of the ways in which a supply chain can become more agile? Um, well, I would start answering your question by referring back to the beginning of this interview where we talked about uh, the average markdown in a department store now is 40% signaling a huge amount of, of excess supply of some products, uh, yet uh, cus customers who fill out a survey uh, say one third of the time we can't find what we came for. So there's also shortage. Uh, how do you correct that? How do you better match uh, supply with demand? Have less of the wrong products, more of the right? There, there are really three things you can, and you need to do all three together. Uh, more accurate forecasts, a better choice of the right inventory levels, and a flexible supply chain, which means uh, uh, short lead time, the ability to uh, supply the quantity the market needs efficiently 
which might be a lot or it might be a little, uh, what has caused uh, supply chains to be inflexible uh, over time, I think, is uh, a number of factors, but probably the biggest one is the pursuit of low cost uh, by sourcing from Asia, uh, China being at the head of the class in terms of countries that people source from. Uh, I actually first visited China teaching in a warden program for six weeks with my family in 1982 in Shanghai. And the, uh, pretty much the only other Westerners we saw were buyers from apparel companies. And they were the first wave. You know, that was really the beginning. China normalized relations with the U.S. in 1979. Um, and that's when apparel companies realized that wage rates in, in China were about, what, 3 percent of what they were in the United States. And, and that caused a flood of gravitation, of sourcing of, of products from apparel, toys, consumer electronics, uh, many other things, from China and other Asian countries. So that's a length in the supply chain from miles to halfway around the world. That's probably the biggest factor that's caused supply chains to be uh, inflexible. There are lots of other choices you make in a supply chain between slow and cheap versus fast and expensive, like do you ship by boat or by air? Right? Uh, you can measure cost, and companies are very conscious of cost. The value of speed is harder to measure. That value is better in stock, better revenue, but you don't have a direct measurement. So you know it costs you an extra $3 to ship something by air. The gain you get from that is, um, is unknown and probably in the future. You pay, you pay the $3 today, the gain's in the future. So th there's a tendency f for what's immediate and measurable cost to be overweighted relative to what's harder to, which, which is valuable but harder to measure, speed and flexibility of the supply chain. So every time there's a fork in the road for companies, do I pick slow and cheap or fast and expensive, the bias is to take the slow and cheap route. Yeah. Now, you do mention in your book the example of companies like World and Zara yes. uh, that have done a really uh, some very innovative things with their supply chains. Uh, are there lessons that other companies could learn from their experience? I, of course. Of course there are, all well described in the book, I think. Um, the, uh, the, I think the first lesson is to know in this choice between slow and cheap, fast and expensive, when is it appropriate to choose fast and expensive? Um, it's not appropriate for stable products with very predictable demand. We use an example of uh, Campbell's chicken noodle soup. It's been around for more than 100 years. Um, long shelf life, uh, so excess inventory is not going to go obsolete. You'll sell it eventually. You may have to hold it a little longer. Uh, very predictable demand. Uh, you don't need speed and flexibility in the supply chain for that. Uh, you can contrast that with fashion apparel, toys, uh, with this huge spike demand at Christmas, uh, many consumer electronics products. Products that have a, a gross margin of 50% or more, so missing a sale is extremely expensive. Uh, for those products, uh, you need flexibility. Zara. Uh, which is pretty well known. Uh, World is a Japanese retailer, less well known in the West because they sell only in Japan, but similar practices to Zara. And then just a couple miles from where we're sitting here in Philadelphia is Destination Maternity, um, a company started by Rebecca Mathias, a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania, uh, with a crushingly dominant 50% share of the women's maternity market. All three of these apparel uh, firms have adopted uh, a, a DNA of speed and flexibility. They, they can get back in stock, produce more, and get back in stock on a hot selling item in two weeks, whereas that number for uh, 
other retailers would be measured in months, usually four months or more, which, it, which for a seasonal product means it's game over. Right? If it's selling well, uh, too bad. <laughs> Uh, you can't get back in stock. And they do a whole set of things. Some are, are sort of obvious and mechanistic. They, they'll buy undyed fabric uh, and keep it in inventory so they can quickly cut it and dye it. They use a laser for cutting so they can cut a single la layer of fabric. The less mechanistic, obvious thing they do, which I think many retailers miss, is they realize that if you want to quickly react to demand, get back in stock on a hot seller, the time uh, to make decisions needed to do that uh, for many retailers will be rather lengthy and will be a big part of the lead time. So they empower uh, product brand-based teams in the trenches, uh, the lowest rung of the, of the organizational ladder, to be empowered to make decisions. You want to make more of this product? You can't get exactly this button, but you can get one like it. Is that okay? Uh, they can s decide yes or no, yeah, it's okay. Uh, the, the team will have a designer on it, and they'll say, yeah, that'll work. So they'll be somewhat uh, scrappy and street smart in, uh, in matching what the materials they can get with what the market's telling us is needed by the market. Uh, any, any thoughts on how retailers can improve their store-level execution? First of all, I think we all shop and we all uh, experience store execution. Uh, when we go to a store, can we find a parking spot or not? Uh, is it easy to find the entrance when we get in? Is the store easy to navigate? Uh, does it look neat and tidy or messy? Uh, if we need help, can we find somebody? There's a whole set of uh, components of our shopping experience uh, that affect how we feel and are we gonna Next time we get to the end of our driveway, are we going to turn left and go back to that retailer or turn right and go to the competitor? When I ask my students, when I talk about store execution, uh, who's had a bad experience shopping? Uh, every hand goes up. Who's had a bad experience that made you really angry? <laughs> every hand goes up. <laughs> And I could spend 80-minute class just listening to viscerally angry stories about bad experiences they've had shopping. I just suspect you've had that. I know I have. Everybody has. And it's a huge, huge problem for retailers, right? Uh, there's a, a couple ideas described in the book that I think are important. One is getting staffing levels right in the store. The uh, quantity and experience of the store associates. We worked with a number of retailers who collected customer satisfaction data, uh, surveys from their customers on shopping experience. And you could correlate uh, how satisfied was the customer and their overall number with factors that might drive that satisfaction. And almost always across a, a variety of retailers, it was three things. If I need help, can I find it? Is the person knowledgeable and helpful to me, the store associate? And can I find the product I came to buy? So at the end of the day, people who shop have a mission, and if they can accomplish their mission, they're happy. Uh, so we've generally found uh, that stores, on average, are understaffed. And again, it comes back to the measurable being overweighted relative to the unmeasurable. Uh, you write a check at the end of the month for a salary for your store associates, that's measurable, known, and immediate. The value of having 10% more payroll budget and therefore 10% more people in the stores um, is harder to measure. So retailers tend to understaff. We developed a statistical technique for correlating revenue with level of staffing in a retailer based uh, in part on these customer satisfaction surveys. And we found in one example that uh, every dollar more you spent on payroll added $10 in revenue on average. It varied by store and by month, so you had to apply it in a granular way because some stores were overstaffed, you wanted to cut them. But, but this technique lets you measure the revenue impact of payroll. Uh, now you think about the economics. To spend a dollar 
this month to get $10 in revenue this month, uh, with a 50% margin, you're getting $5 in profit for a dollar in expense. That's a great deal. And it's not an investment because it happens within the current month. So that was what we saw as an execution void is, number one, an overweighting of, of the payroll expense, viewing labor as sort of an expense rather than an investment. Uh, and number two, not being able to, to staff in a way that takes into account the impact of staffing on, on revenue. One final question, Marshall. What advice would you give managers of retail companies to help them succeed in the new normal global economy? Oh, well, this uh, <laughs> new normal is uh, hard to define, but uh, let, let's first of all say what, how that phrase is often used, is we've just been through the worst ec economy, we're in the midst, really, in some ways, if you look at unemployment, or the worst economy that you and I have experienced. So far, I think the Great Depression of the 30s is in first place, but who knows how this is all going to play out. Uh, so there's this sense that the economy will recover, but that it will be uh, somehow fundamentally changed uh, in ways that are uh, hard to discern. I'll just mention one possibility, which uh, many retailers believe, is that during a recession, uh, people become more price conscious. And if you look at the impact of the recession on retailers, for the vast majority, maybe 90%, it was bad news. Revenue went down. Surprisingly, there's some retailers that are counter-cyclic, that do better, do as well or better. So who would you guess would be a counter-cyclic retailer that does better in tough times? Uh, probably the, the discount retailers. Yeah, so who would be at the t head of the class? The Walmart. Walmart, yeah, right. Walmart. Uh, auto parts retailers. Right, right. right. Any, any do-it-yourself mm -hmm. retailer. Mm -hmm. uh, did as well or better during the recession. Will that persist? Um, it's a very interesting question. Uh, and of course the Wal Walmarts of the world say, of course it will. Fundamentally, people have changed their buying behavior, and price matters more now, and, we'll, and there's a whole generation that went through this lousy economy, like the Depression generation, and they're going to think about life differently, and they're going to be more price conscious. Um, the other thing that's going on now, and I think will persist for a long time, is deleveraging. People are paying off their credit card bills, which means they're spending less. So there's a great reduction in consumer spending levels that's going to have a big, big impact on retailing. Great. Marshall, thank you so much for speaking with us today. Michael, it was my great pleasure. Thank you for having me.